Chapter 451, This World Does Not Belong to You Royal God Call was indeed quite the lucky lad. He was the first to die to the Shadow Mist Assassin after it had become enraged. After that, the Shadow Mist Assassin killed four other players. Only then did the monitoring team realize that something was amiss with the boss. By the time they reported the matter and came to a decision on how to deal with the situation, a sizable number of players had already died at the hands of the Shadow Mist Assassin with a good number of them no longer lingering around at the spawn points. For these game employees that were working on the backend data, it was truly a tall task to sift through the identities of those unknown individuals from all the players that had respawned during that period of time. However, thanks to Royal God Call's inability to discern directions and find his way in the city's heavy fog, his fear of leaving the spawn point after respawning and losing his way made him stay put which subsequently allowed his data to be restored. It was a piece of cake for the employees working on the restoration of the player's data to restore those players that had their data assets locked. As for those who had left the spawn points upon respawning, the monitoring team had limited options for them. Following their trail to the spawn points was one such possible solution. It was easy for the employees to pick up a royal god call and restore him back to the spot he had previously died since he did not leave the spawn point this whole time. Royal god call was still at a loss on what had just occurred as he stood amid the fog, feeling all alone. Naturally, the man was elated when he discovered that his level had been restored to its previous state, even recovering the proficiency points he had lost in his skills equipment durability, and other such figures. He quickly began discussing this matter with everyone over the mercenary channel. In the previous process, Sword Demon, Young Master Han, Brother Assist, and War Without Wounds had all gone their separate ways to make the other players leave the area as soon as possible. The risk of the Shadow Mist Assassin targeting them subsequently increased with the departure of the many players and reached a point where the four men did not manage to make a successful getaway. Still. Since this had happened in the late stages of the incident, they were also included in the list of players that could be locked down and frozen, so their restoration was far cleaner and faster than Royal God Calls. At the moment, the mercenary channel was busy discussing the stupid boss's configuration, as well as the magnanimity of the game company for compensating the players in such a way. Did those players that were killed by the boss, which had strayed to I City's gate, receive any sort of recompense? War Without Wounds remarked. Nope, the all-knowing brother assist answered. The situation back then isn't anything like the present. Back then, the players had low levels, so losing a level isn't that big of a deal compared to us now, young Master Hans said thusly, somewhat maligning the game company. Actually, the game company had not done this countermeasure previously not because the losses were minuscule but because it had happened during the early stages of the beta when they were still inexperienced in handling such matters and the technical conditions were not entirely in place to make any sort of recompense. The many technical methods they had applied for this incident were actually developed and valued accordingly as a result of the previous incident. As such, it could be said that young Master Han and the rest were living in the good times right now. During this discussion, Royal God Call finally feebly asked, Is anyone coming to pick me up? On my Wii, Gufei replied, No, my current set of coordinates have changed. Royal God Call quickly gave them the new batch of numbers. Everybody was shocked. The coordinates he had provided were not too far from where they were and he was definitely not anywhere within the city. Aren't you dead? They asked. I've been restored as well just like you guys. Royal God Call figured out what had happened to him after digesting their discussion. Why did they restore you as well? War Without Wounds asked. Fuck. I also got killed due to the boss becoming enraged. Royal God Call cussed. But you've been dead for such a long time even your corpse entered rigor mortis. This shouldn't happen to you, too. War Without Wounds continued to scorn him. The two began to quarrel over the mercenary channel before young Master Han muted the them since he held the authorization as the group leader. Dash 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 dash. By this time, all the other players that could be restored had already been dealt with accordingly, and they soon saw a notice of apology from the system. Furthermore, publicly reporting the application of the remedy work to inform those remaining players that were affected, but the employees had trouble locating to take the initiative and contact a GM online. Once their IGNs were made known, 
the employees working on the backend data would have a much easier time verifying their experience to be in line for a restoration. In order to prevent other players from fishing in troubled waters, the message severely pointed out that those who would deliberately disrupt this process would be dealt with as if they had tampered with the game's day-to-day -day operations. Putting up this notice in the game was naturally not enough. The game officials put up the same notice as the headline topic on the official website's main page the next day, openly admitting to the mistake and calling those involved parties contact them as soon as possible if they had not received their due compensation yet. They even made sure to alleviate the players' worries by promising to conduct a thorough investigation into the boss and would return the monster back to the game once the appropriate revisions were made. The Shadow Mist Assassin was not alone in undergoing an investigation, for the senior designer of the R&D department Yeezy Aou was also under scrutiny. This event had unfolded in such an unexpected manner all because the issue with the Shadow Mist Assassin's extremely stupid aggro formula was something he had not expected. Had this not been the case. Yiziaou would have long since fixed the configuration of the boss, instead. Why would he wait until today? Even the wisest man made mistakes. This was a saying that Yiziaou was experiencing in person right now. He had originally designed the boss to be punishingly difficult for the players, but it brought him such a large trouble as a designer. Instead, even worse was the fact that his utilization of the modification tool to change the game configuration had been swiftly unearthed. When investigating how the boss got enraged this time, they naturally touched upon the condition that would cause it to enrage. Had this been under normal circumstances, Yeezy Ahu's private use of the tool would have been ignored. But the situation was different this time. The entire monitoring team by the game administration department had personally witnessed the boss in rage, and what they witnessed was far from what the condition had stated. Was it a program error or something else? Following their investigations along this trail, they quickly found a log entry of an alteration made using the modification tool. Yeezy Ahu did not wait for them to discover him as the culprit and simply stepped forth, admitting his actions. Why? Everybody was surprised as they stared at him. They knew that Yeezy Ao often called himself a scrupulous game employee, so nobody had expected him to be the one that transgressed this first violation. Yeezy Ao appeared calm. I simply don't wish for the bug in Parallel World to further impact it, a bug that further impacts the game? Everybody was confused. Were you trying to verify the bug that is present in the Shadow Mist Assassin's existence? The bug I'm referring to isn't the Shadow Mist Assassin. Yeezy Ahu pointed at the scene being shown on a certain computer screen, it was a replay of the enraged Shadow Mist Assassin fighting with Gufei and Eternal Dominion. I meant those guys. Them? Everyone turned to gaze at the screen. Can't you guys tell? They're players possessing far more expertise at fighting than the average player. Their existence hugely undermines the equilibrium of this game. Two level 40 players working together have actually slain a level 60 enraged boss. In which MMO have you seen this sort of matter occur before? Yiziao asked. Everybody was silent. What he had said was not entirely illogical for the skill that these two players had demonstrated was truly rather excessive. You guys have also seen the boss's drops. Shadow Mist Assault is a level 60 and above assassin skill. With a player potentially having it in his or her possession, what's the point of playing this game further? He continued. Everybody remained silent. The aggro formula for the Shadow Mist Assassin might indeed be problematic, and I am held accountable for instigating this terrible incident. A dereliction of duty are part as game designers. However, with such a bug like these sort of players existing, I insist that we must find some way to stop them. Even if we cannot forcefully restrict them from gaming, we must not allow them to have free reign within the game. The other players need a fair environment, Yeezy Ahu said. Nobody made a sound, and only the team leader of the monitoring team that patted Zia Ahu on his back. The boss is calling for you. This boss was also the biggest boss of Parallel World. While Yeezy Ahu had no real power, he held the position as a senior designer of the game. Now that he was the one causing trouble, none of the people present had the authority to deal with him. Thus, their only option was to report this to the higher-ups, which resulted in the boss calling to have Yeezy Ahu sent over. Yeezy Ahu obstinately held his own view of the matter not showing any signs of fear as he walked out of the monitoring office to meet with the boss, 
leaving behind a crowd of whispers. Yi Xiaowu was considered to be the core of the parallel world's design, so it could be said that parallel world would not be able to exist without him, and was someone who had sweated and toiled to contribute towards its creation. While he might have committed a huge foul that was a fireable offense to the company, everybody believed that this issue would most likely result in a slap on the wrist and eventually swept under the rug. Furthermore, Yi Xiaowu's actions were not done out of self-interest or personal gain, and quite a few people agreed with what he had just said. Everybody felt that there was no need for this matter to be so severely investigated. Dash 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 the boss's office. Behind a broad office desk, the boss was standing with both his hands behind his back as he waited for Yi Xiaowu to arrive. When he heard the knock on the door, he called out for the man to enter and turned round before taking a seat on his chair. The boss looked gloomy, while Yi Xiaowu continued to hold that stubborn expression of his. Yi Xiaowu had been holding on to his thoughts on how to suppress or even eliminate this bug that was goofy for the longest time, never once expressing it in full to anyone else. Today's incident could be said to be the fuse that lit this matter within him. From the point when he had used the modification tool. He had already involuntarily made the decision to walk down this all-or-nothing road. He had already swore to eliminate this bug once and for all. I don't think there's any need for me to ask for the reason? The boss said. Yi Xiaowu nodded. You already know about this, this sort of people, I know. The boss had directly interrupted Yi Xiaowu's words. The existence of this sort of people in an MMO is game-breaking. I already knew this as you've already told me this before. I also mentioned that there should be some sort of solution to the matter, but it was definitely not through utilizing the method you just did. The tone this boss had taken was unexpectedly severe, which Yi Xiaowu found rather surprising. He had discussed this matter of such bug players with the boss before and he knew that the boss was rather concerned about this. However, he never would have thought that his illegal manipulation to restrict such players from making further advancement would anger the boss so much, causing the man to treat him so indiscriminately. But, there's no buts. Yi Xiaowu's words were once ruthlessly interrupted. I can understand making a mistake in your work like an unreasonable boss configuration. That is forgivable. However, there's no way I would condone your action of using the modification tool in such a manner. Are we just allowing them to continue on like this? Yi Xiaowu was unyielding as ever. Letting them carry on as they were would at least be better than what you are currently doing. The boss said, this imbalance born from individuals themselves is an age-old problem. If you use such methods to deal with skilled players, what of those pay-to-win gamers? Surely, you're aware of the power that real money has in a game. Do we consider rich people as another form of imbalance, too? Yi Xiaowu was suddenly stumped. Sure enough, he had never once considered whether pay-to-win gamers were a form of imbalance themselves or not. We can design the perfect game on our own to try shortening the gap between such players and the average players, but we definitely don't have the authority to create special regulations for them. A MMO needs a uniform standard as well. Go back home and think about this carefully before coming back to see me, the boss ordered. Yi Xiaowu was in a daze as he turned round. Before he left the room, he could still hear the boss's last few words. You may have created this world, but this world has never belonged to you. Chapter 452 Trade the company soon announced Yi Xiaowu's punishment, suspension. Everybody within the company felt that this was inappropriately blown out of proportion, as what Yi Xiaowu had committed could be seen at a glance. Was there really a need to suspend the man and place him under investigation? Everybody felt that this was just the company's way of giving a proper account before the many eyes focusing on this matter, and that everything would return to normal with the lifting of the suspension in a few days' time. Who would have thought that, shortly after departing from the boss's office, Yi Xiao would pack up his things, carry a box, and see the boss again? What do you mean by this? The boss was furious when he saw him like this thinking that Yi Xiaowu was protesting against his punishment. Even though he was a core member of R&D department, the company would definitely not be crippled if he decided to call it quits, which was why the boss was extremely disappointed by his action. This isn't a protest. Yi Xiaowu was calm as he said this. I truly wish to resign. Give me a reason, the boss demanded. We do not see eye to eye, philosophically speaking. He replied, So what you're saying is that you completely refuse to accept my ideology. 
the boss aside. I have to stick to my belief, Yizia Wu said. Is that so? So what are your thoughts on those pay-to-win players I've mentioned before? The boss asked. While playing the game may tilt the scales in their favor, it is not to the point of significantly affecting the game and will certainly not be game-breaking. Only a sufficiently heavyweight can tip the scale so thoroughly. Pay-to-win warriors are not that, but those guys definitely are, Yi Ziao insisted. The boss sighed deeply once more. This young man before him was smart and talented. He had always regarded him highly but he never would have thought that he would actually stand his ground like this. A clever man that stood his ground was far scarier than one that did not. This was because, most of the time, clever individuals had plenty of self-confidence to the point of being conceited. No one should expect such people to concede their beliefs and ideologies for others. If that's the case, you may leave. The boss did not bother saying anything more. He only hoped that this young man would come to his senses sooner than later. I do have a request, Yizia Wu said. Speak. Since I'm no longer an employee here, I wish to play the game like a normal person, he said. The boss was stunned. He did not expect that this young man would make such a request, but he very quickly nodded his head. It was now Yizia Wu's turn to be astonished. He had not expected that the boss would agree to his request directly like this. He had originally thought that this request of his would be rejected, in fact, he even thought of means by which he could fight for this right in the event he got rejected. A shred of doubt could not help but surface in his mind seeing how readily the boss had agreed to his request. Are you wondering why I agreed? The boss asked, gazing at the young man. Yizia Wu nodded his head. Looks like we really do differ in our philosophy. The boss sighed. Since you are no longer part of the company, why should I forbid you from playing the game like a normal person? Before, you truly don't understand. Why do you think the company restricts its employees from playing the game? For fear of you having a better understanding of the game? That's nothing but a superficial reason. The fear is in the power you people hold. We are afraid that you guys will abuse this power, like making use the modification tool or defrauding the system through the alteration of the backend data. Be it damaging others or for personal benefit. These are all instances I don't wish to see. But with your resignation, you lost the rights to access this power, so what other reason is there for me to worry about you playing the game? The boss asked. But the level of understanding I possess in this game is very different, Yizia Wu said. As a core member of the game, you are of course different. Surely, you haven't forgotten that non-disclosure agreement you signed with the company? Although you're no longer a member of this company, this agreement still stands. Thus, once we are certain that your actions violate the terms in that agreement, you will have to face the company's lawsuit. Non-disclosure agreement. Yizia Wu smiled. If that's the case, then I suppose there's really nothing for everyone to be worried about. With his chin held high in pride, Yizia Wu strode off like a victorious general amid the countless pairs of watchful eyes. The looks directed toward him were a mixture of pity, shock, sympathy and even gloating. He did not pay heed to any of these as he departed without a backward glance. Dash 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 back in the game, after their protracted fight with the boss, everybody was feeling very tired. Even those gaming fanatics who would play through the night found it difficult to continue and logged off to rest once they returned back to the city. The next day, when everybody got online, Brother Assist immediately read out the notice that the game company had posted on the official website's homepage. As the active participants, victims, and eventually compensated of the incident, everybody was feeling gratified. Royal God Call took this chance to request for Gufei to show them the boss's drops, reminding the others that the boss was successfully hunted down by Gufei, and they all proceeded to request the same thing from him. Of course, I got items. Gufei slowly answered. Everybody waited eagerly for him to link it onto the mercenary channel for them to see, but he savagely left them hanging for a bit, vexing the others so much they loudly condemned him for his inconsiderate action. Eventually, though, Gufei linked the two items worthy of note onto the channel. Andrew Su's diary. These mercenaries were in different places, but all of them read this name out in tandem with the item link in their hearts together. Meanwhile, the item description contained only a single line, an ordinary looking diary. Nobody could make sense of what sort of meaning this particular line of words had at this time, so they pestered him to give the diary a quick skim, 
asking him about the second item that he and Eternal Dominion got while they were at it. Shadow Mist Assault, Assassin Skill, instantly appear and execute a high-speed strike that deals a powerful blow to the target. Everybody read this. Immediately after, Brother Assist exclaimed, Hey, why did you type that out and not link the item? They could easily click on the diary's link on the Mercenary channel to read its description themselves, but as for the second item, he merely typed its description on the channel. Oh, the diary is with me, while the skill scroll is with Eternal Dominion, Gufei informed. Oh. Everyone nodded. It seemed that the two had already split the boss's loot equally between them. Still, since they had no idea what that diary was used for, they considered that skill scroll as the more substantial loot. Aware of his goal to help Eternal Dominion earn money, they reckoned that he had intentionally given the item to Eternal Dominion. Besides Sword Demon, the others held no sort of illusion or desire for that item. That skill scroll was useless to them, after all, as the game did not allow its players to learn skills from other job classes. Given that the boss was confirmed to be high level, Sword Demon was quite tempted to have it. While there was no specification of how high the skill was, it was guaranteed to be higher than what all the skills players had at the moment. Simply put, this was a high-level skill scroll. The game did not restrict the players through their levels when it came to learning skill scrolls or donning equipment, so learning a high-level skill was as significant as obtaining some high-level equipment. Moreover, plenty of experts in the game possessed unique skills that others did not have access to. Sword Demon might not have said as much, but he was nevertheless slightly envious of this. Of course. An expert would wish to stand out from the crowd. Now that such a chance was poised right before him, he would not qualify to call himself an expert if he did not cherish it. How much? The honest sword demon asked frankly. I'm not too sure myself, Gufei answered. Saying this, he candidly reminded sword demon, Do you have money? I think you still owe me some yourself. Considering sword demon's character, Gufei believed that the man was most likely short on cash right now. Otherwise, he would have long since returned the 1800 gold coins he owed him for the lasting sentence and dying breath. That was no small sum, so he figured that Sword Demon started saving money to pay him back the moment he got the daggers. In fact, he had even considered selling off Frost Memories, and only when Gu Fei told him that there was absolutely no rush to the matter and to just slowly save up did Sword Demon give up on this thought. After all, this was something that he was somewhat unwilling to do. Back then, Brother Assist had priced the weapon set that came with a skill, lasting sentence and dying breath, at 3000 gold coins, and, similarly, the bandit leader Sato's rogue skill scrolls Shadow Walk had been bought off by Svelte Dancer for 3000 gold coins. Sure enough, Sword Demon awkwardly admitted. I currently don't have enough. Can you speak to Eternal Dominion and get him to reserve it for me? I'll try and find some way to raise the funds. Since Eternal Dominion's job class clashed with the skill scroll, there was no way he could use it on himself. Still, the man was someone with an urgent need for money, so Sword Demon was worried that he might sell the item off at the first opportunity. That guy has a pressing need when it comes to money. I'm afraid he may be unable to wait. Gu Fei said. If that's the case, Sword Demon was quite despondent. How about this, then? I still have some money on me. I'll buy it first, and you can slowly return it to me after, Gu Fei suggested. This. Sword Demon had not thought that Gu Fei would do this. Everybody knew that aside from the income he had gotten from their mission, just the fact he had gotten 1,500 gold coins from Svelte Dancer in that first segment of the mission meant he was richer than anyone presently around. Brother Assist, how much do you think that skill scroll costs? Gu Fei turned to ask Brother Assist. Um, I haven't seen that skill before or even the data description of it, so it is a little difficult for me to provide too high an estimate, but we are well aware that this item was dropped by a high-level boss. As such, I think a price around 2,000 to 2,500 gold coins should be a fair. This price range was within Gu Fei's estimation and was also considered as acceptable by Sword Demon, but it was still a bit of a stretch to say that he was currently cash strapped. But Gu Fei had already interjected, I'll pass you 2,000 gold coin, quickly go buy it off Eternal Dominion. Sword Demon really did not wish to take this sum of money, 
but he was worried that Eternal Dominion might sell the skill scroll off in his impatience. Conversely, it was not as if he intended to drag out paying back Gu Fei, so why should he be conflicted about doing so? With this thought in mind, he accepted his suggestion readily. All right, I'll borrow the money from you now. I'll be sure to pay you back as soon as I can. There's no rush, take your time. Gu Fei said. Then, can you please contact Eternal Dominion for me as soon as possible? Sword Demon was anxious to complete the transaction, afraid that the skill scroll might no longer be available for purchase. He's not online yet. He may get online later tonight, so there's no need to hurry, Gu Fei said. I, speaking of which, why are you online in the day? Don't you have to go to work? They were all puzzled. Today's is teacher's day, so I have a day off. Gu Fei replied. Chapter 453 Andrew Su's diary The discussion on the mercenary channel was put on hold as everybody headed toward a tavern to meet up. Besides handing over the money to Sword Demon, the main reason they were meeting was to further research and analyze the diary that Gu Fei had picked up. Brother Assist said, There's really nothing much worth mentioning if that boss dropped just a blank diary, but since it's a diary that has entries, there may be something worth noting within. Everybody thought that what he had said made sense. So they requested Gu Fei to bring the diary over for everyone to pour over. Of course, the man had no intention of hiding it either, so he casually tossed the diary onto the table after handing over the money to Sword Demon once they were in the tavern. It looks really ordinary. They commented. It's about the content. Content. Brother Assist reached over to take the diary even as he asked Gu Fei, Have you looked through it? I just skimmed through a few random pages. Gu Fei answered. Brother Assist took it into his hands and carefully turned it open to the first page, as if the diary would turn to dust the moment he exerted any amount of strength on it. The text was very clearly handwritten, and the content was sparse beyond a few lines. Brother Assist prudently read the content out loud. I am the Shadow Mist Assassin, Andrew Su, unremarkable and of no repute, which is why I am still alive. This is a rule that an assassin must adhere to. The day my name become renowned, that will surely also be the day I die. Oak Forest, a small log cabin. The newly sprouted oak trees have bright red leaves, which, according to Gru, resemble blood. HMPH. What does he know? Has he even seen real fresh blood before? This is the 142nd time I met Gru and received my 187th assignment in my assassin career. It is said that the moment I accomplish my 200th assignment, the League of Assassins will confer me a special reward. Just 13 more to go. This number doesn't seem to be very auspicious. Everybody was stunned as they listened. Royal God Call was the first to speak up, is this a novel? Nobody bothered with him. Brother Assist flipped to the second page, and the text was even more sparse. The air in Lin Shui City is still as humid as ever, but I like it. But the quiet days by the harbor are long gone. Plenty of people have suddenly appeared around here, making it extremely crowded, which is such a pity. At the end of the second page, Royal God Call once more piped out. Many people? Did he mean the players? None of them wanted to get to the bottom of this question, and Brother Assist merely flipped to the third page, which held even less text than the second page. What a heavy fog. In such an environment, it is extremely easy to strike and slip away. Looks like the mission this time will go extremely smoothly. The fourth page had even less text than the page before, totaling up to three words. Crap. I'm lost. Everyone could not help but glance at Royal God Call. The boy had a very empathetic expression on his face, sighing deeply as he became emotional. Poor thing. Is there any mystery within these few pages? War Without Wounds asked. Don't think so. It seems to be the background information of that boss, Sword Demon said. There's more at the back. Brother Assist had already flipped over to the fifth page. Are we gonna spend a whole afternoon sitting here reading this diary? War Without Wounds found such an eventuality to be utterly terrifying. This diary sure is strange. I feel that there must be something hidden in this. Perhaps, it is a clue to a quest, Brother Assist conjectured. MMOs often used items like this as a key to start a quest, but the other MMOs always immediately listed this on the player's quest logs and never required players to painstakingly read diaries like this. Efficiency was the key to these experts present and they would only do quests for the rewards that came within. As such, 
they always looked for the most direct approach to completing quests fast and did not care much to savor the plot at all, which was why they were quite annoyed at the discovery that this matter required them to pay attention to details. I'm sure there's something here. It just so happened that Brother Assist was someone who enjoyed this sort of endeavors. In that case, we'll have to rely on you for this. Call me if you find a quest in that. War Without Wounds stood up. I'm going to take a walk around the city. Hey, wait for me. Royal God called up to his feet. He needed someone to accompany him from place to place inside the city, so he had no choice at where to go and could only rely on others to guide him around. Seeing that somebody was about to leave, he did not let go of the chance. Sword Demon got up as well. I'll take a look around the city, too. He now had a buttload of debts to pay off so he must seize every moment he got to earn money, he just did not have the time to carefully pour over the diary. Go on, then. Brother Assist waved these people off as he continued to flip through the diary, except his speed was much faster than before. What else is written in there? Since he was no longer reading the text aloud, Gu Fei and young Master Han had to ask. The two of them remained at the tavern. It goes on about how he's trying different ways to find his way back. Brother Assist answered. Every page was filled with solutions that the Shadow Mist Assassin had come up with. He tried to repair his compass, but he had no idea how to fit it back after dismantling the compass, and he utterly ended up turning it compass into scraps. He tried to get his bearings by looking up the sky, but the fog inside the city was ever present, be it night or day, no matter which direction he looked. He could not even see the sun much less the stars. He tried distinguishing the poles through the lushness of the tree branches and leaves or density of the annual rings of the trees, but because of the persistent fog pervading the region, the sunlight inside the city seemed not to make a difference across the day, while the annual rings were all evenly proportionate. He kept leaving marks along the way, and that was how he learned that he had been back at his starting point over and over again. He even tried calling out for help loudly but he got no response in the end. There were many more attempts after. Why isn't he dead yet, then? Young Master Han could no longer stand it. It's written over here. Finding ways to survive in the wilds is a basic skill every assassin possesses. I must persist. I'm sure I will find a way out of this heavy fog and complete my assignment. I, the Shadow Mist Assassin, and Jisoo will not die in this fog. Brother Assist read out. Brother Assist knitted his eyebrows after reading this. He reread this passage two more times before lifting his head to regard the two men. What do you guys think? Think about what? The two questioned. Do you think this might be a clue? Brother Assist reiterated. You're saying that the assignment this assassin hasn't accomplished is now handed over to the players? Gufe asked. Brother Assist nodded. You should take it if that's the case, then. Young Master Han turned to Brother Assist. Does your quest log show anything? Brother Assist shook his head. Who knows what the content of this quest could be if there are no prompts, Young Master Han said. Brother Assist shook the diary in his hands. There's still more. Continue reading. Then, Young Master Han took a swig of his liquor. Hey, it's tiring. Brother Assist complained. While he read aloud the first two paragraphs in his enthusiasm, why should he continue doing so for the rest of its content? It was not his hobby, after all. Let's read it together, then. Gufe went over to Brother Assist's side and squeezed in with him. The two lifted their heads over to young Master Han. The questioning gazes they shot him were clearly asking if he wanted to join them. Just tell me your findings after you guys are done. Young Master Han said evenly as he continued to imbibe his liquor. He felt that the two of them crouching over a little book like that was foolish enough as it stood. Adding himself would just make it beyond childish. Thus, the two men proceeded to ignore young Master Han. Brother Assis sucked in a deep breath and flipped over to the next page. Day 47, or should be. I've been lost in this fog for 47 days. Birds and beasts, even the insects have all become my source of sustenance. The water from the fog that condensed on the leaves is far more abundant than I first thought, possibly the only good thing about this heavy fog. I won't give up. If I keep at a certain direction and walk straight ahead, I'm sure to get myself out of this quandary. 47 days. Brother Assist quickly checked the page number. This diary doesn't appear to have daily entries. Only a child in grade school will write a daily recount, Gufe said. That's true. 
Brother Assist nodded in agreement. Let's continue. Gu Fei himself flipped over to the next page. I thought that following along in a single direction will finally get me out of this place, but it appears that I am mistaken. This day, the place I went by seems to be very familiar. I don't wish to admit it, but I know deep down that I've once rested at this place several days ago. The adjustments I've made to mask my trail are like a sign to me. Perhaps, deep in my heart. I have subconsciously made my markings. I wonder how many of such markings have I made along the way? This right here. Brother Assist was excited. Markings. Could this be a sort of hint? Is that considered as a hint for us to head over and find the trail that will ultimately lead us round and round? Goofy asked in return. He should have left markings where he passed, Brother Assist said, and there might be further messages for us in those places he went by. Don't be in such a hurry. Gufei pacified brother assist. Even if we know that that's a hint, how are we gonna know what sort of hint it is? We can't possibly blindly search the entire city for it. What will we be looking for? You are right. Brother assist nodded repeatedly. Quick, let's carry on. Thus, Gufei flipped another page. I have no idea how many days it's been. Really? The last time I made a record was on the 47th day but so many days have gone by since then. I suddenly feel absent-minded. This is truly a terrifying thing, an assassin that actually can't recall what date it is. Forgetting a minute or even a second is already enough to result in death. This fog is slowly eroding me of my will. I can feel it. Why does it sound as if things have gotten serious? Gufei asked. Next. Brother Assist felt that there was nothing worth noting when the Shadow Mist assassin talked about his feelings. He did not really care either and could not wait to get to the next page. I haven't moved. I haven't moved for the whole day. This is not the first time this has happened to me. Several times when I woke up before, I would find myself having forgotten which direction I originally came from, or which direction I should be heading next. That's right. I know where I should be going, it's where my feet are pointing toward. However, when I fall asleep, I still continue to shift my posture. Just like today, when I woke up, I could not immediately grasp my dagger when I reached out for it, and I found it at least two yards away from where I lay. Has my body begun to dull? Why is it more of this? Brother Assist was a little annoyed as he anxiously flipped to the next page. I see a tree. An oak tree with reddish-orange leaves. I've seen this sort of leaves several times before when I was at Gru's, and did it always be in September? September. Have I been wandering in this fog for half a year? Is Gru still waiting for me to hand in my assignment? Can I still succeed? Perhaps, he should find someone new to do this assignment. Instead. A-H-H-H. I got it. Brother Assist shouted. We should be looking for that NPC called Gru in a little log cabin in an oak forest. I'm sure we'll get the quest once we show him this diary. Chapter 454 a meaningful mission? That's definitely a possibility. Young Master Han nodded in approval. But an oak forest with a little log cabin? That's too little clue to go by. Who knows how many such locations exist in this game. There's also that NPC called Gru. I'll go find out. Brother Assist looked excited, as if he had just discovered the new world, when he got up and headed straight for the exit. Where are you off to? Gu Fei hurriedly asked to investigate the lead. Brother Assist smartly waved his hand as he rushed out. Such moments were when he looked the coolest. And there he goes. Gu Fei was in a daze as he stood holding that diary. These people sure were gamers. This diary was like a novel to him, so he actually wanted to carry on reading. He had initially thought that Brother Assist was a kindred spirit, but who knew that the latter would take off once he found even the slightest clue he could follow up on? Quests. All these guys care for are just quests in the end. Gu Fei thought of this in exasperation as he flipped over to the next page. I am talking to myself again today. It's becoming more frequent nowadays. I've always been alone, so I should have been used to this sort of loneliness by now. It seems that being alone isn't so scary. But what's scary is when you're all alone and without help. Am I already in a state of panic deep in the recesses of my heart? I once more came across an oak tree. I find myself coming around here quite often recently. I don't know why, but that oak tree feels familiar. Perhaps, it may jog my memory. Assassins should abandon everything, but I already am nothing. All I have now is this bit of memory, and I don't want to lose it. This is so depressing and tragic. 
This diary was an account of a strong-willed and determined assassin's step-by-step -step descent into mental breakdown after getting lost in the fog, alone and without any reprieve. Even though this was clearly just a NPC, Gufei could not help but lament. What would the final outcome of someone like this be? Discovered by players and be slain for its loot? Of course, not for that was just the fate of its role and not the fate of the character. Gufei's curiosity was piqued, and he could not wait to get to the next page. I woke up with a start and realized that snow is covering the land. Is it winter already? I immediately began searching for that oak tree as if I've gone mad. I'm afraid, afraid that it would lose the color I remember it for and I would no longer be able to recognize it. In the end, all is fine, as that oak tree looks the same as it was before. Just like me. A layer of white snow is covering it, but the color of its leaves remains the same. Do the leaves of an oak tree not fall come winter? If it doesn't wither, what about me? Am I searching for a way out, or am I just searching for this oak tree? Gufei sighed deeply. It was apparent that this assassin had started to give up, and it could only find solace from its past. The content of the entries that followed after only served to confirm Gufei's thoughts. As the Anjusu within the diary began to reminisce about the scenes of its 187 assignments one after another until, one day, it finally wrote. I heard that the moment someone is about to die, their life will flash before their eyes like a movie, playing back every moment. I've actually been constantly thinking of my past these few days. Has that moment of death already upon me? Is the process of this really so slow? Is it about to finish? Gufei wondered to himself. He suddenly did not wish for this Andrew Su to die in such a manner, and he was hoping that he would chance on some sort of opportunity to turn its fate around. It never happened, however. The content of the pages that Gufei continued to read through became more and more muddled. However, as the NPC continued to recall its past, the assignments finally reached the 187th count which was also this very assignment that it was unable to accomplish until today, and quite possibly the last assignment it would get in this life. Giordano, to think I'd actually still remember this name. He's the captain of Zyata City's Vigilante Corps. This man doesn't hold the highest position among all the people I've assassinated, but there may be some unforeseen difficulties given his identity. Thinking about this man now, my numb hands seem to tremble ever so slightly. Looks like I've not lost all my fighting spirit, after all. Here. Gufei suddenly slapped the table. Half the content of the glass young Master Han was drinking from spilled with that slap, the heartache he felt was so severe he wanted to die. He furiously spat at Gufei who was sitting across him, what are you shouting out for? Look here. Gufei turned the diary over and placed it right before young Master Han. This bit here mentions the assassin's assignment target to be here in Zyata City. From you guys' line of thinking, we may be able to continue the assignment as a quest if we kill this man. Young Master Han casually scanned through it before he asked, Did you receive a quest? No. Gufei shook his head. Not one prompt sounded from the system. Young Master Han sneered mockingly. Not getting a quest doesn't mean it can't be done, Gufei said. Then, what's the point of doing it? Young Master Han asked. Gufei, instead, gazed right back at him and asked, You're drinking your liquor every day, what's the point in doing that? It's my pastime. Good answer. Gufei nodded. Motherfucker. Young Master Han cursed angrily within him for he had actually been verbally cornered. Challenging a difficult fight was naturally this man's pastime. The Shadow Mist Assassin's target of assassination, the captain of Zyata City's Vigilante Corps, indeed sounded like a rather challenging boss. I wish you the best of luck, then. Young Master Han raised his glass toward him. Aren't you gonna come and watch? Gufei asked. Young Master Han admired the glass of liquor in his hand and looked at the refracted Gufei within. That is not my pastime. Gufei arched an eyebrow, picked up the diary, and got up. I reckon those guys won't join you, either, young Master Han added. You didn't even receive any quest prompt, they'll all think that this is a meaningless pursuit. I know that. Gufei nodded his head and left the premise. Meaningless pursuit? Then what will be a meaningful pursuit? Kung Fu was his personal aspiration, something that he considered as the most meaningful pursuit, 
yet the real world made it seem like a meaningless existence. Just thinking of the fact that his personal mission was deemed by others as a meaningless pursuit made it really quite lugubrious. Did he wish to continue Andrew Sue's final mission so as to challenge an expert? That was actually not the main reason he had done so. To him, there was simply no way he would recognize this sort of AI that originated from the system as an expert. Contesting against a machine like this NPC was meaningless to him as it was no different from practicing his kung fu on a sandbag target. He had merely been somewhat affected by the content of Andrew Sue's diary. He even wondered to himself, with such a noteworthy story in this game environment. Why does everyone prefer to spend all their time grinding monsters and collecting gear? This is a fully immersive world, after all, people can pretty much live another life here. Grinding monsters to level up. Why does everyone walk this same route? Gufei was playing this game for the sake of being in an environment and world where he could use his kung fu freely. Level and equipment were unimportant to him. After reading through Andrew Su's diary, he suddenly felt as if he could also act a role in this world, a role that would allow him to demonstrate his kung fu. Doing something like this sounded a lot more interesting than grinding on monsters. Pondering on this, Gu Fei tried to contact Brother Assist in hopes of troubling the man to inquire after this NPC Giordano, but upon pulling out and checking his friend's list, he saw that the latter was apparently offline. As always, Brother Assist would have to go offline whenever he went hunting for information. He was able to have such a large pool of information precisely because he was active in various sites and places. As such, the only option left for Gufei was to ask the people on the streets. Since it was unlikely for strangers he met on the street to patiently answer his queries, he decided to fire off a message to Slaris. Do you know a NPC that goes by the name of Giordano? I don't know. Slaris answered. What about Zia the city's Vigilante Corps, then? Vigilante Corps? Slaris was still confused. Gufei sighed. Truly, plenty of players out there only sought to finish their quests at hand in the fastest time possible and get their rewards, so how many of these people would actually take the time to carefully savor the remarkable backstory and setting of Parallel World? Someone like Slaris, whose name made it within the ranks of the five unyielding experts would be especially mindful of her efficiency, so why would she waste her time on such aspects of the game? In that moment, Gu Fei suddenly missed June's reign. If that lady had first spawned in the city, would the NPC Giordano have escaped her perceptive eyes once she carefully explored and researched through every quest available in the city, even if she could not remember it? The quest notebook that she carried everywhere she went was equally as legendary as Royal God Call's Book of Coordinates or Brother Assist's Information Booklet. Then, sorry to trouble you with asking your friends to help me inquire about this matter. Gufei had no choice but to implore Slyris's help, hoping that this lady would know a friend who was as talented as June's reign. Okay, Gufei was just pondering on what he should do while he waited for news to get back to him when Slyris unexpectedly messaged him back. No need to inquire on others, my little sister knows. Oh? He was elated. Speak with her yourself. Slyers said. Gufei and Yenzi Azu had added each other as friends as well. This was a common practice in MMOs, which was similar to how people would exchange name cards in real life. It did not matter if they conversed with one another, since exchanging names to befriend one another was the courtesy practice in MMOs. I don't know what group you're talking about, but I seem to recall this NPC Giordano, Yenzi Azu said. Let's hear it. He's over by the government city hall informed Yen Zizu. We can't enter that place, right? Gufei asked. He knew of the government city hall as well, it was apparently the central administration of any city and was where the city mayor and other such NPC authorities resided. However, the government city hall was inaccessible to players at all, and there were far more guards protecting its entrance than anywhere else in the city. According to the officials, Players who wish to enter the government city hall must attain a certain status in the corresponding city first. There was no further information beyond this, and the players themselves would have to work it out for themselves. Naturally, this invited plenty of swearing from the players, and those who had really conducted a research, saw no result to their work. Gufei had no idea if anyone had ever achieved the condition to enter the government city hall, 
but he gave it a shot when he was bored. The guards had stepped forth to block him just as he was about to show his intention of stepping through the doors, any further and he and the guards would be at swords points, which evidently showed he did not have permission to enter. Indeed, players aren't able to enter. I once helped a friend out with a quest, and our team received temporary pass to the place, so I got to enter it once. There, I noticed a NPC called Giordano. Oh, what made you take note of him? He asked. Chapter 455, City Hall Courtyard It's really difficult to relay information like this. Why don't we meet up? Yenzia Zhu asked. Gu Fei thought that Yenzia Zhu seemed to have an understanding of the situation and was about to ask if she had the time to meet up, so when she suggested it herself, he was nationally more than delighted to. Since the matter of inquiry was related to the government city hall, the two of them decided to meet up right outside the entrance to that building for convenience's sake. The entrance he was pointing out was the gates right by the government city hall's courtyard where a single guard stood in place. Players were allowed to have access to this large courtyard, but permission was required to enter the government city hall itself. Gu Fei was the first to reach the gates of the courtyard, proceeding to stand right in the middle of them once he confirmed that Yen Zizu was not there yet. Before he could see someone appear from the fog, he first heard a sound nearby, but this sound was not a human sound made from the one he was waiting for. This sound was the soft yet distinct sound of clitter clatter and as he was wondering what it could be, he spotted Yenzia Zhu conscientiously kicking a piece of rock as she stepped out from the fog. The sound was from that rock rolling along the ground. With her head lowered, Yenzia Zhu continued to focus on what she was doing despite already reaching the entrance to the courtyard. A rock steadily rolled forward as she dribbled it between her feet, and only when that rock bumped into somebody's foot and got stepped on did she finally raise her head and realize that Gu Fei was already there. Hey. You got here before me. She greeted. Gu Fei nodded his head. She's got talent. He exclaimed in his heart. He had watched Yen Zizu dribble that rock for 30 meters, and from a professional standpoint, he could say that she had a rather outstanding lower body coordination and would be a good candidate for studying Kung Fu. This was naturally just a thought he had as he had seen plenty of good candidates throughout his life. Tell me what you know. Gu Fei immediately dove straight to the topic at hand. Come take a look. Yen Zizu brought Gu Fei into the courtyard and pointed over to a bunch of players at the southeast wing. See those people over there? I see them. Gu Fei nodded his head at that group of seemingly bored players. This was the prime time in the game, yet these players were not grinding, questing, running errands to earn money, or even grinding for gear. Instead, all of them were squatting by the corner of the wall looking bored to death. The expression etched on their faces clearly said, I'm bored. They are from the guild, flower gazing in the fog, said Yen Zizu. Gu Fei had heard of this guild. Brother Assist briefly introduced it as the largest guild in the city when they first arrived at Sai Ao City. He could not recall what the guild leader's name was called, but if he was not mistaken, the man should be a warrior. This information came to his mind even as he nodded his head. What do they have to do with Giordano? Gu Fei asked. Well, it's like this, Yen Zizu began. Their guild was rewarded a quest for placing first in the PvP tournament. This quest required them to meet the NPC called Giordano in the government city hall, but because the quests and missions found in the game could randomly result in a battle, they were worried that speaking to Giordano would lead to some boss battle despite the quest prompt not explicitly stating this possibility. As such, they gathered a bunch of people from the start and gotten quite a number of high-level individuals to help. I happen to be one of those people they gathered, Yen Zizu explained. Oh, then, what happened? What happened? Well, we did find Giordano and heard it issue the flower gazing in the fog their quest. Apparently, there's not enough manpower in the government city hall. So he was hoping that the flower gazing in the fog guild could help supplement this and bear some of the work that NPC left after saying that, Yen Zizu said. What sort of guild quest is that? Gu Fei asked even as he wondered if this had any relation to his intention to assassinate Giordano. From the incident that had happened in Y City, there was no way Parallel World could simply be seen as just a game. In many ways, it would also develop along with the changes in the world. And Gu Fei's interaction with the werewolves in Yeguang village was a good example of this. He soloed that chain quest, 
yet the fact that it happened to have something to do with a quest of traversing four seas, a guild that was far from related to him in any sense, just went to show this problem. I'm not too sure of the specifics because those invited, including me, left at that moment, but what followed only required the participation of the flower gazing in the fog's members. I heard that they have to make certain progress with that quest, requiring them to complete chores every day to make any headway. At first, even simple tasks, such as cleaning the courtyard by cutting the grass, helped further their progress, but the things they could do dwindle with each passing day. Eventually, they could no longer make progress by repeatedly cutting the weeds. As such, they are unable to find anything to do to complete the mission 100% even to this day. That's why those people are still wasting their time here. Yenzi Azu pointed over to that bunch of people at the corner again. To think there would be such a thing. Gufei wiped his sweat in his anxiety. He had initially thought that traversing four seas guild quest was troublesome enough, but now he knew that there was an even more inhumane mission here. Traversing four seas guild quest at least had clear targets and goals for the players to work toward, yet this quest here in Zaiota City had a completion bar without a hint on what sort of general activities the players were expected to do to complete it. Seeing all these players while their time here with a listless look, Gufei asked. So what are they trying to accomplish by squatting over there? That's not it. I heard that they originally expected to achieve a 100% completion rate for the quest, but some random noob came running around the place without knowing anything and even went as far as to attempt to enter the government city hall, ending up getting executed on the spot by the guards. Those flower gazing in the fogs players that were in the courtyard at that time, even watched the spectacle unfold. In the end, when Giordano came out to announce the progress of their quest, it reprimanded them for being ineffectual and went ahead to dock 10% off their progress, pissing those guys off to no end. Yenzi Azu explained what had happened next. So I see, Gufei thought even as he swept his gaze over to those men at the corner of a wall. Suddenly realizing a huge problem, he asked, wait a minute. Why is it this courtyard of the government city hall doesn't have fog? Gufei was carefully looking all over the place when he asked this. All was foggy beyond the gates, yet everything was visible to him in this courtyard, which lacked the ever-present moisture thickly pervading the air in Zaiatu City. Yen Ziazu nodded. Normally, realizing this fact only after a long time would elicit ridicule, yet she was different from others. This was because she had also made the same mistake the first time she visited the courtyard. She was used to the clear skies as she was a player who had emigrated to the city from another city, so it would often take her a while to realize the change after entering the premises. There's an explanation for this, too, she said. Ever noticed how the fog is less heavy within Zaiatu's city walls? Apparently, the city has a device that reduces the density of the fog and it is located within this courtyard, which is why the fog here is all but gone. What sort of device is that? He had never heard of such a device before and was asking this purely out of curiosity. Who knows? Perhaps, it's a huge energy crystal that for which is activated, Yen Ziazu hypothesized. Gufei curiosity quickly dissipated as he went back on topic. I recall you saying that Giordano will announce to them the progress of their quest daily. Does that mean it will go to the government city hall's courtyard every day? Yup. Yen Ziazu nodded. Have you gotten some sort of quest for it? Gufei did not say a word. Honestly speaking, he had no idea if this was considered as a quest because his quest log did not list any prompts toward this end. Besides, he was not really too familiar with this lady beside him, so he had no intention of revealing his hand this early. However, this last Yen Zizu was apparently still wet behind her ears. Her inexperience made her unable to grasp people's intention through observation, so when Gu Fei refrained from answering her, she just assumed that the latter had not heard her, so she went ahead and repeated herself in a much higher volume, What quest do you have? Um, just to locate it. I'm still not certain if this is a quest or not, Gufei answered vaguely. Oh, are you looking for Giordana to give you a quest? Just say hi to those guys from Flower Gazing in the Fog first and then approach the NPC when he steps out, Yen Ziza said. Must I exchange words with them? Gufei was perplexed. He had always thought that NPCs were public property. Remember that incident that I mentioned before? After that incident was made public. 
some of the flower gazing and the fog's enemies began to cause trouble for them by sending people to barge into the government city hall. Flower gazing in the fog could no longer afford to be careless, so they've been keeping a close watch over players entering the courtyard from then on. Haven't you noticed that those guys over at that corner have their eyes on us this whole time despite them appearing lackadaisical? Yen Ziazu asked. You're right. And there's even thieves in stealth mode outside the courtyard. Gu Fei looked around properly. There are even archers trained on us right now. This used to be one of the largest player trading locations in Ziaota City, but thanks to that quest of flower gazing in the fog, not one player besides its members is in sight. Women enjoyed shopping. Now, that the original shopping district in Ziaota City was gone, Yen Ziazu's tone when she said this seemed to be filled with resentment. Oh. Gu Fei casually answered. He was not at all concerned with such matters. He had simply discovered that there were plenty of obstacles in his way if he intended to go ahead and assassinate Giordano. Even without the players from Flower Gazing in the Fog keeping a close eye on players that would enter the courtyard, there were still quite a number of NPC guards securing the premise. Even if he wished to do the deed here against Giordano, he would have to do so like Xiaoyun Fat One going in with guns blazing. It would definitely be a far cry from being an assassination. Gu Fei could totally emulate that style if he were merely going against players. The average player might be unaware, but how could he not have a clear idea of the NPC guards' might? He had to be careful in front of those things, which meant he would have to properly plan this assassination out. All right, I'll take my leave first. He felt that he had learned quite a bit from all this, so it could be considered as a worthwhile trip. Hey. I can help you find out what time Giordano comes out, Yen Ziza said. Oh, thanks for that. Gu Fei said. Just as the two of them were about to leave the courtyard, they saw another bunch of players entering the courtyard from the fog outside. Yen Ziza immediately whispered, Look, that's the guild leader of the flower gazing in the fog, three sides of flowing maple. Things can't get any better if you are able to directly make contact with that man himself. Hey. Saying this. She found herself exclaiming in the next moment, isn't that big brother drifting? Gu Fei had already spotted the top mage in parallel world presently, drifting, heading toward the courtyard with three sides of flowing maple. Of course, the man could be considered as number one only under the condition that Gu Fei excluded himself from the category. Chapter 456 Climbing the wall both parties met right outside the gates of the courtyard. Three sides of flowing maple recognized Yen Ziazu at the same time that she did. One of them was part of the ten great adepts of his class, while the other was one of the seven bottlenecks. They were famed individuals but not exactly friends. They only happened to be fellow acquaintances. At the moment, they exchanged the briefest of nods with each other, but Yen Ziazu enthusiastically addressed drifting with a crisp, big brother drifting. Drifting merely smiled at her and then noted Gu Fei's presence. Why are you here? Ha ha. Just walking around, Gu Fei said. With that, he greeted the two partners of his, left hand of love and right hand of cool, that were never too far away from drifting, hey left hand, right hand. He did not directly call them, for even to this day, he was still unsure if he could identify them individually. And this person is. Three sides of flowing maple was curious toward the identity of Gu Fei. Thus, Drifting introduced Gu Fei. His name was quite possibly the most renowned and was an existence even greater than the legendary five unyielding experts. Three sides of flowing maple quickly began apologizing profusely and showered him with praises and admiration the moment he heard this. Gu Fei was quick to modestly accept his kind words, not daring to show a lack of etiquette. Once that was over, Three sides of flowing maple asked, Did the two of you come all this way to attend to some matters? Do mention it if there's anything you need. He expressed this out of goodwill, for he was clear what sort of treatment they would receive from his guild the moment they entered this area. However, Gu Fei was well aware that what he was intending to do might very likely cause serious trouble to them. Considering that their guild quest was given to them by Giordano, and he was here to assassinate that same NPC. Would that not mean his success would result in their progress bar to take a 100% reduction? This was why the more courteous three sides of flowing maple acted toward him, the more embarrassed he felt. In the end, 
he decided that it was best for him to avoid forming any sort of relationship with a man. Just as he was about to casually say a few words and take his leave, Yen Ziyazu's enthusiasm got the better of her, thinking that this was a good chance for Gu Fei to directly ask the guild leader for a favor. She blurted out, Wonderful. Guild leader flowing maple, ah, eh. Yen Ziyazu had barely gotten half of her words out when she yelped, for Gu Fei, who was suddenly beside her surreptitiously gave her a pinch. He was worried that he might not have enough strength to get her attention, so he even found an acupuncture point with that pinch. He did not hold back any of his strength as he thought of how weak his mage body was. Yen Ziyazu had not been struck and slashed by monsters much ever since she began playing Parallel World, so she had never experienced such an intense pain before and instantly cried out loud in agony. Turning her head to question Gu Fei, she saw him give her a look as the man quickly sent a private message to her at the same time, don't say a word. She was no fool. She could tell that he had other plans once she read the message. Fortunately, that pinch of Gu Fei did not deal any actual damage to her, so Yan Ziyazu was not resentful about it, especially since the pain had quickly faded away, so she immediately kept her mouth shut. Nonetheless, everyone heard her shout and three sighs of flowing maple regarded her questioningly. What? Gu Fei also acted his part and stared at her with a curious expression. Yen Ziyazu giggled a bit before saying, Ha ha, it's nothing. I just suddenly realized that guild leader flowing maple looks really dashing today. We're leaving. She dragged Gu Fei and fled, afraid that she would be unable to answer any further questions if three sighs of flowing maple pressed her further. Three sighs of flowing maple felt that he had been splashed by a bucket of cold water after that exchange. Drifting, who was standing next to him, chuckled at this. He he, young lasses are always so strange. Hmm, you're right. This guild leader quickly recovered his senses and put on a look of maturity. Dash 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 dash. Gu Fei and Yan Ziyazu fled until they entered the fog, only heaving a sigh of relief once they saw nobody following them. At this. She promptly turned to Gu Fei and complained, You almost killed me back there. He he, thank you for your hard work, Gu Fei merely said. Tell me why you didn't let me raise the matter to three sighs, then. And it's such a good chance, too. Could it be that you have a hidden agenda in mind? She emphasized the words hidden agenda. She had evidently made up her mind about the issue already. None of your business. Go on, look for your sister and play. Gu Fei did not answer her question. Hey. Hey, you can't do that. How can you have the nerve to just toss me aside after you've used me? She demanded. This lass sure loves to string her words so recklessly. Saying something like used me makes it sound so distasteful. Gu Fei thought about this as he said, I mainly want to consult you about that matter we've discussed before. I am extremely grateful for your help, and now that our consultation is over, what's gonna happen next? I'll take care of things myself. Yen Ziyazu could tell that Gu Fei had no intention of going further into detail, as he was most likely unwilling to divulge anything to her, but she was still rather curious toward this matter, so she could only remark accordingly, Then, I'll wait till you're done before you tell me all about it. Fine with me. Gu Fei nodded. The two said their goodbyes at this point. Gu Fei made note of his position and direction before heading off to that tavern. Sure enough, Young Master Han was still there. Gu Fei immediately called out as he made his way to the man, that spyglass you've got with you, hand it over to me for a bit. Does your quest have the prospect of attaining a solution? Young Master Han finally called it a quest. After all, Gu Fei's definition of a quest was clearly not confined to those only appearing on their quest logs. I'm gonna check things out before deciding, Gu Fei answered even as he took the spyglass from Young Master Han, leaving the tavern. Gu Fei once more made his way back over to the government city hall's courtyard. He took a quick look around him after rounding a corner and, locating a desolated spot, pivoted as he called out, Come on out. I know you're here. No response. Gu Fei grabbed a meat carving knife and flung it in a certain direction. Stop hiding. The figure of a thief appeared upon dodging that knife. Yen Ziyazu asked in her astonishment, How did you know? Gu Fei did not give her a response. In fact, he already knew that she had faked her departure from the very start and very quickly went to follow him. He merely thought that, given how curious she was, 
it was better for him to keep watch over her by allowing her to tag along instead of letting her run amok on her own, which might bring him unnecessary trouble. This was why he was not really bothered by her trailing him thusly. Are you gonna do something? She had been following him all this while and simply could not make sense of what he was doing. She could not see anything special about the spot he had chosen to stop, so she took a step closer to look. She saw him take out a large coil of rope from his dimensional pocket and begin to carefully straighten it out. The end of the rope had a cross claw hook attached to it, and he continued to measure at the rope even as he gazed up the high wall before him. Whoa, you can't possibly be thinking of climbing your way up there, are you? Yen Zizu was surprised. That is indeed my intention, Gu Fei affirmed. It's really high up. Yen Zizu raised her head to have a look as well and gauged that the wall was well over 10 meters tall. Yeah, I'm seeing if my rope is long enough, he agreed. Then, why aren't you uncoiling it? She could see that he was still curling up his rope. Don't you know your multiplication? He scoffed. Kids these days are really far too inflexible. Education has failed to teach them anything. Only at that point did she understand what was happening. He had neatly coiled the rope loop by loop to make it easier for him to judge how long the rope would be by multiplying the number of coils together. It's about there, I should have enough, he deduced in the end. Next, she saw him throw his hand out in one smooth motion. That hook quickly found purchase atop the wall, with two tugs to test its hold. Gu Fei managed to accomplish this feat in just one try. Just what are you trying to do? Yen Zizu was completely taken by the expertise he had just demonstrated. You want to go up first? He asked her. Is it sturdy enough? She was a little worried. Of course, he confidently assured. As a martial arts practitioner, he naturally had a very professional understanding of his weapons. He was very clear about the tinsel strength of the rope and he was certain that it would have no problem holding the weight of a person. You can go up first, then, she said. She was actually hoping to see a demonstration. No need for that. We can go together, he said, pulling out another coil of rope from his dimensional pocket as if he were doing a magic trick. He tossed this one right up the wall as well. Is there more? She asked numbly. It's enough. He replied. He was already hanging on the rope on the left as he was saying that. Yen Ziazu quickly did the same to the other rope. That was when Gu Fei began to carefully explain to her the procedure. Lower your center of gravity and mainly depend on your two arms to get you up. Don't use too much strength with your legs, or the rope will sway. Yup, exactly like that. Halfway through with his explanation, he trailed off as he saw her fall down to the ground. Plenty of things looked easy in theory but people would only realize there was a technique to things when they are actually doing it themselves. Are you sure you want to continue? He asked. I am certain and sure, she replied determinedly. The key to this lie in what I've just told you. Here, let me give you an example. He grabbed hold of his rope as he said that. Next, his hands and legs nimbly worked in tandem at a steady pace. Gu Fei's demonstration made such a scandalous act such as climbing a wall, look like a form of art. Clearing up three meters in the blink of an eye, the man turned to look at her. Got it? Let me try. She tried it again. Her second try confirmed his previous assessment of the young lass. Gifted with good coordination, this talented lady was able to quickly grasp the essentials. Even though her actions were not as polished and trained as Gu Fei's, she was at least able to slowly make her way up. Just what exactly do you do? Seeing how familiar he was towards such activities, she could not help but suspect that he was in a special line of work. I'm a teacher, he answered. DSK, she clicked her tongue. She had no idea that Gu Fei was telling the truth and had automatically assumed that he was calling himself a teacher as a jest since he was currently teaching her this skill. Yup, just like that. Stabilize your center of gravity and slowly make your way up, he continued to instruct her. Actually, the shaking isn't too much a problem. I won't fall as long as I hold on tight to the rope, this sort of thing in this MMOA. Poof! Gu Fei had no choice but to slide back down to the ground. Firmly looking at the fallen her, he said, I know you have more stamina here in the game, but the shaking isn't because I'm afraid that you can't hold on. I'm afraid that the hook will become loose. Gu Fei sighed as he picked up the fallen hook and threw it up the wall once more. Tugging at it to make sure it was securely fastened, he passed it over to her. Now, do you know not to shake about? I know. 
She rubbed her sore butt as she fought back her tears. Let's carry on, then. He took the rope and began his ascent while keeping an eye on her to make sure she was properly doing the same thing as him. This time, the lass finally no longer dared to be careless and gingerly made her way up in accordance to Gu Fei's instructions. However, she was overly cautious this time, so her climbing speed was much slower than before. He looked up, at the rate that she was going, there was a high possibility of her not having enough strength to clear that last stretch despite them being in a game. Still, he did not dare to hurry her, for he was aware that the lady was already afraid to fall yet again. The more he rushed her, the more anxious she would be, which would only make it all the more difficult for her to continue her ascent. All he could do was hope that her actions would become smoother the more she climbed, slowly increasing her speed as she went along. In the end, Yen Ziazu had instead maintained that slow and careful climb up. Finally, after clearing over 10 meters, Four or five meters were left to reach the top of the wall. The last turned to regard him. I don't think I can continue climbing further. Having accompanied her all this while at her pace, he nodded as well. I, too. So what do we do now? She asked. He sighed and then raised his hand to point above them. Yen Ziazu had no idea what this meant and looked over to where he had pointed even as she heard him chant, Translocation, blank. Chapter 457 Observers Gufei blinked over to the top of the wall. The top plate of the wall was thick enough for him to stand firmly on. At a glance, a heavy fog was behind him while a large courtyard, which was as clear as a day, lay before him. He quickly lowered his body, for he did not wish to be spotted by others. He then heard Yen Ziazu, who was still hanging on the rope, angrily shout from below, Quickly pull me up. I'm a mage. I don't have the strength. He sighed. You're sure to have the strength to pull one person up. It's not like I'm heavy, she said through clenched teeth. She was possibly the first person in this game to have used up all her strength. At the moment she was no longer moving as she hung there in midair. She refused to slide down and call it quits, wishing that she could just pounce up and bite that man when she heard how free and leisure he sounded after blinking up the wall. Why bite? That was because, aside from her mouth. No other parts of Yen Ziazu had any fight left in them. Let me give it a shot. Don't struggle wildly, he said as his two hands went to grab the rope. Actually, he knew in his heart that, while he might not have much strength as a mage, it was still enough to pull this lass up. That was exactly why he had blinked to clear the final five meters. It was to save what little stamina and strength he had left so he could pull the lady up. Gufei had no intention of laughing at the plight of someone stuck in midair like this. Such a despicable act would be more in line with young Master Han than him. With both hands, he really managed to pull her up. The lass immediately sprawled on the wall's small walkway the moment she reached it, panting heavily. Experiencing such lethargy in game was not easy for players. Gufei was no better himself, for his wish strength was currently at its pits, but he was not at least not indecently lying there sprawled out like her. He was just quietly sitting at one side. Yet his labored breathing showed how exhausted he was. When Yen Ziazu's breathing returned to normal, she turned her gaze onto Gu Fei and saw that he was carefully keeping the two sets of hook. Curious on how he had come across such items, she asked, Where did you get those things from? I made them myself, he answered. You made them yourself? How'd you do that? She pressed on. He looked at her and raised one of the hooks before her. Find something like this, then get a lengthy rope and tie them together. Logically speaking, the more durable the rope is and the heavier the claw hook is, the better it will be. I'll go make one myself when I get back, she decided. What would you make one for? For fun. Her answer was uninspiring. He no longer paid heed to the lady. Stowing away both hooks into his dimensional pocket, he took out a quill and a booklet, he then placed the booklet on his lap. Following this, Gu Fei rummaged through his pocket with his left hand for quite some time before managing to retrieve the spyglass. Noting the time, he began his observation. What? What are you doing? She was perplexed by his series of actions and his possession of so many weird things. I'm making a note of the activity patterns of the NPC, he explained. NPC? Activity patterns? She confusedly looked down at a place not too far away which required no spyglass to have a clear view of. There were two kinds of NPCs found in the courtyard of the government city hall, 
first was the guards standing stationary at their posts and second was the guards patrolling the area. You mentioned that Giordano comes out daily to tell the flower gazing in the fog of their guild quest's progress. By day, do you mean the day in game or the day in reality? Gufe asked. Naturally, these two were separate time frame altogether. A day in reality had a cycle of 24 hours. But a day and night in parallel world was only on a six hour cycle. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. She responded. Well, it doesn't matter. We'll find out real soon, he said. What exactly is your quest about, for it to require you to locate Giordano? She found this entire business becoming more and more fishy by the minute. Assassinate him, he answered matter of factly. Her mouth hung agape for quite a while. Eventually, she asked. Where did you get this quest from? What's the reward? Normal quests found in the game would often list the sort of rewards players would get upon completion to help the players make a decision on whether to do them or not. For instance, a thief would naturally not bother to do a quest if the reward shown was a magic staff. Gufei did not say a word and merely fished out Andrew Su's diary and tossed it toward Yen Ziazu. Andrew Su's diary she pronounced the item's name aloud. What is this? Who is Andrew Su? It's that boss that has been making the headline on the game's official website these two days, Gu Fei informed. The Shadow Mist Assassin. She exclaimed. The Shadow Mist Assassin had been the top news all throughout Parallel World for two days now. Of course, she was paying close attention to this as she was a player from Zia the city where the incident had happened. Two of Yen Ziazu's friends happened to be among the victims of the Shadow Mist Assassin's massacre yesterday, and she personally heard from them about that encounter with the boss. They told her that they had not even caught a glimpse of the boss's shadow, all they felt was a gust of wind, and the next thing they knew, they were dead. It was unavoidable that the accounts would be a little overly embellished, but it only emphasized just how frightening the Shadow Mist Assassin was. Thus, after the official's announcement regarding this bug involving a boss, plenty of players were curious on what had become of the Shadow Mist Assassin. Unfortunately, the game officials did not deign to share details regarding that, so everybody just assumed that the boss was deleted from the system after the discovery of the bug. The rumors about the outcome of the boss had only started spreading like the tendrils of a grapevine, yet she was actually seeing a drop from the boss presently which astonished her greatly. She could not voice her doubts, however, as upon flipping the diary open, she immediately read the self-introduction of the Shadow Mist Assassin. Naturally, she had all the reasons to believe that this was the work of the system, would there really be any player out there who would be bored enough to write a diary about a boss's life just to mess with others? How did you get your hands on this thing here? This was a point that she was bound to feel suspicious of. It dropped upon the Shadow Mist Assassin's death, was his answer. How did it die? She probed. I killed it, Gu Fei replied simply. I don't believe you. How could you possibly manage to slay the Shadow Mist Assassin with its high level? She was cynical about the factuality of his claim. Of course, it wasn't just me alone. I had the help of a friend in killing it, he supplied. Friend? Who's that? Recalling those she had seen with him, she thought that it might be the flip and odd couple she had met before. Even though the two men were famous experts, the impression she got of the real royal god call and war without wounds was largely a disappointment. Eternal Dominion. He did not bother to say anything else past the man's name. This was because there was really no need to do so. As one of the five unyielding experts, only a noob who had just entered the game would be unaware of Eternal Dominion's name. Sure enough, Yen Ziazu was aware of the person's background. She was now staring at Gu Fei as the line from a famous Dang poem, When great scholars gather to talk in good spirits, the guests will all be far from ordinary, surfaced in her mind. Applying this to the man before her, it naturally meant that he was constantly surrounded by peak experts from the two men, drifting, and now this eternal dominion. That person he was chasing after to slay was also. It was unknown who had uncovered the fact about Southern Lone Blade losing yet another level yesterday. He was already no longer among the five unyielding experts, and now he was also not even near the levels of the ten great adepts and the seven bottlenecks. Southern Lone Blade was really at a loss on how he should react to the fact that someone was keeping tabs of his progress. In short, the news that he had lost yet another level already spread wide across the entire parallel world. The moment Slaris and Yanziazu caught wind of this, 
they immediately knew that this was Gu Fei's handiwork. Yen Ziazu had more or less verified this diary's origin, so she asked a follow-up question, what's the point of showing me this for? Look here. He reached out his hand and flipped the diary to the part that the Shadow Mist Assassin had written about its 187th assignment, which was also the part it talked about the NPC Giordano. Oh. She quickly got it. This is where you got your quest from, huh? What's the reward? She immediately asked two players. The reason why they would be compelled to do quests was ultimately to receive the rewards for completing the quests. Gufei was different, though. His only reason for coming all this way to do the quest was his personal fascination to it. What? No reward? It's also not shown on the quest log? She was extremely surprised the moment she heard about this. Then, why are you even doing it? He mulled it over for a bit before he answered, for fun. Yen Ziazu admitted her defeat. It was truly an answer she was unable to rebut. So what you're doing now? She finally had a little understanding of what he was currently doing. You're checking out the movement patterns of those NPCs below to find an opportunity to make an attempt on Giordano's life? You're spot on. He nodded. The movement of the NPCs is all programmed, and they'll follow their route to the letter. It's really simple. Then, there's really no room for error in what you're doing as even miscalculating it by a second can result in failure. She exclaimed. It was now Gu Fei's turn to be shocked upon hearing this, for he had not too long ago heard a similar statement. He could not help but think of that one line in Andrew Su's diary, to the Shadow Mist Assassin, forgetting a minute or even a second is already enough to result in death. That line resonated well with the current situation he was in. Could that diary actually have some hints to his current quest squirreled within its text? Would it really be so clever? He muttered to himself. He had read the diary not too long ago, so his memory of it was still fresh in his mind. Besides that line, he could not really think of any other part from its content that would be serve as a hint. Could there be hints further into the book? He wondered. There were still pages after that which he had not read through yet. I think it's best that I finish the task at hand first. Halting his strain of thoughts, he proceeded to continue his observation of the NPC guard's movements. With the entire courtyard visible before him, he was able to memorize each and every position of the stationary NPC guards. Similarly, he made sure to carefully note down the route that the patrolling guards were taking including their movement speed while doing so. All these were still considered to be his preparatory work. Aside from making a record of things, Gu Fei had no idea what else he could analyze. After all, he needed to know when Giordano would appear before he could refer to the NPC guard's situation at that moment to find a possible chance to spring his attack. As such, he kept his eyes strained on the entrance to the government city hall where Giordano was bound to appear. Once he appeared, the pathing it choose, as well as the other position of the NPCs about, would be taken into account, only then would he have a full grasp of the situation. Everything that he could take in at the moment was simply the foundation that his attack would be based off from. Hey! Yen Ziazu suddenly realized something. We're not gonna be camping out here for almost six hours, right? That depends, six hours might not even be enough. He was also rather distressed by this fact. He might have the day off from work today, but he was certain that this quest would not be accomplished any time soon. Did he have that much time in game for this? Chapter 458 The Wandering Giordano Time trickled by, and in the blink of an eye, Gu Fei and Yen Ziazu had spent a full hour hunkered down up the wall. However, that did not seem to affect Gu Fei's concentration in the least as he continued to observe through his spyglass with one hand and make notes on his booklet with the other using a quill. The lass, who was overwhelmed with boredom at the side, only had the diary to kill time. Evidently, she was just a very ordinary gamer, so she found such an endeavor to be extremely pointless. If she wanted to read a novel, it would be a lot more comfortable for her to do so while lying in her bed instead of crouching atop a wall. Hey, are we really gonna stay here for six hours? She regarded Gu Fei with lingering fear, for the man next to her was truly too frightening, be it in terms of his skill or his mental fortitude. Yen Ziazu could not imagine herself staying put in a place for over an hour with someone and not speaking a word, yet that was exactly what she found herself to be doing today. She had wanted to strike up a conversation with him several times in this one hour, 
but she had ultimately managed to curb her urge each time. Seeing how focused he was only made her feel that any attempts on her part to converse with him could end up jeopardizing the very atmosphere present. However, after a full hour had passed by, she was already at her very limits and felt that she would go mad if she did not break the silence. I did say six hours might not even be enough. Gufe did not even glance at her when he answered and just continued to maintain his eyes on the NPCs in the courtyard. The stationary guards were a done deal, but there were still a few patrolling guards he had yet to fully note the routes of. After all, the courtyard was rather large, and the field of view covered by the spyglass was limited which meant it would take quite some time for him to catalog everything. Do I have to stay here that long, too? She whined. Gufei finally tore his eyes off the spyglass to look at her. I don't recall anyone begging you to stay, and it's entirely your decision to tag along. Yen Zizu was speechless, she truly regretted her choice. Curiosity truly killed the cat, but how was she to know that she would chance upon such a boring task with such a boring person? This is so boring. She wanted to get up and stretch her back, but before she could reach full height, he stopped her with a suppressed bark, don't move unnecessarily, squat down. Yen Zizu was in tears, she could not even stretch her body. You can leave first. He took out a coil of rope and passed it over to her. Secure it properly before you slide down. Yen Zizu did not take it. It was not that she had not thought of leaving, but at the end of the day, she was still really curious and wanted to see just what this weirdo would do eventually. No longer daring to stand up, she could only crawl over to his side and crooked her neck over to read what he had recorded in that booklet of his. That was when she suddenly asked, while the NPCs would strictly adhere to their patrol routes without fail, what about those players from Flower Gazing in the Fog? They have men patrolling the premises 24-7 as well, and they don't stick to their patrol routes like those NPCs. Rather than languishing in her boredom, she might as well join in. This was what Yen Zizu was thinking when she voiced out her rather fundamental opinion. Isn't that why I'm observing them right now? He asked rhetorically. Has Giordano appeared? She asked instead. Nope. Gu Fei looked at the horizon and saw that it was nearing evening in game. The sky was gradually darkening, and even though it would not be entirely dark, the player's vision would still see a significant impact to the change. While there might be benefits to acting in the dark of night, he still needed to see if the activities of these NPCs would be affected by the descent of night. You know, I can help you find out what time Giordano comes out, Yen Ziezu offered. I don't think there's a need for that. We'll see for ourselves in the end, Gu Fei rejected. Since this was something he could find out by himself. He did not wish to raise any suspicion on the matter by asking others unnecessarily. Hey, it's out, that looks to be the NPC. Speaking of the devil, a figure was spotted exiting the doors of the government city hall just as they were discussing about Giordano. I see it, Gu Fei said. The position he had chosen allowed him to have a clear view of the entrance to that building without the use of the spyglass. While taking note of the other NPCs. He had never once seized his attention to the doors. He had already registered the presence of this figure the moment it stepped out of the doors. Was there even a need for Yen Ziazu to call his attention to this new arrival? Is that Giordano? He had no idea if that was the new arrival's identity. It seems like it. Yen Ziazu did not dare to confirm it as a fact as well, for she had only casually glanced at that NPC back when she was mixing with the crowd. Gu Fei focused his spyglass onto that figure whom they suspected as Giordano. The least he could do was take note of how this figure looked since there was a high chance of it being his assassination target. This figure stepped out of the government city hall and slowly went down each step of the stairs. A stir went around those players from flower gazing in the fog that had been milling about doing nothing which confirmed the two's suspicion. Gu Fei began to take note of Giordano's looks. The tall and stocky NPC was a rather handsome and mature-looking male with a short mustache right above its mouth. A great sword hung by its waist, with its left hand resting on the hilt. Each step it took was measured and forceful. Gu Fei was a little worried at this moment. If the players from Flower Gazing in the Fog were to take the initiative to ask Giordano for the progress of the mission, would that mean that Giordano would immediately head back into the government city hall once it finished relaying the relevant information? He hoped that Giordano would demonstrate the staunch hardiness found in NPCs and would strictly stick to protocol and its programming. 
unaffected by the actions of the players around it. Fortunately, the scene unfolded more or less as how Gufei had hoped. When Giordano appeared, the members from Flower Gazing in the Fog did react to it, yet none of them stepped forward. Their eyes followed Giordano as he took each step and began to wander in the courtyard. Gufei's gaze followed accordingly, his hand moving constantly as he made a quick record of things. Meanwhile, there were quite a few changes to the movement of all the NPCs the moment Giordano appeared. Gufei moaned inwardly when he saw this for that meant all the notes he had taken before were for naught. Since the NPC guards would act differently when Giordano was present, he would need to take note of the new changes that occurred once his target NPC was present, and that meant he would have to spend even more time. The only good news from this was that players were unable to affect Giordano's movement. Gufei swept his gaze over the whole courtyard once and discovered that several members from Flower Gazing in the Fog were moving toward a certain spot within the courtyard. A thought sprang into his mind as he shifted his spyglass over to these men. He saw that the guild leader, three sides of flowing maple, and drifting were also among these people. This guy, must he always be hanging around in a group wherever he goes? Gufei instantly recalled how Drifting had joined the Black Hand mercenary group in Yunjuan City. Considering how powerful this man was, it was only natural for him to be able to casually join whatever guild or mercenary group he wished to be part of. In fact, there was probably a whole host of people who would seize this chance. So this guy is actually a job-hopping king. Gufei thought to himself, just as he had suspected. The position where three sides of flowing maple and the others ended up in was the exact same spot where Giordano was making its way to. Giordano had stopped twice during this stroll and interacted with the other NPCs in both instances. The third time it came to a halt was in this very position, where it began to engage with the players, probably to announce the current progress of their current quest. Following this, the attention of the players faded as Giordano continued along his stroll stopping for the fourth time to interact with another NPC. After this, Giordano turned around and headed back directly into the government city hall. Is, is there any chance to strike? Yen Ziazu had also been watching the activities below this whole time and saw clearly that the NPC completed the entire lap under Minnie's watchful gazes. A chance to assassinate Giordano simply did not exist. It's still early too early to throw in the towel. Gufei said, from his rough observation moments before, the route that Giordano chose did not have any obvious spots for concealment, so it seemed impossible for him to complete deed without alerting anyone. Perhaps, it is not that it doesn't exist, but that I have yet to find it. Gufei thought to himself as he made the decision to come and observe the whole sequence again. With that, he began to keep all the items he took out into his dimensional pocket. Yen Zizu was elated when she saw this. Are we leaving? Yeah, I'll come and observe everything again when he next appears. There's no point in continuing my stake out now, Gufei said. He fished out a hook and secured it to the top part of the wall. Slide down. You first. She still wanted to watch a demonstration. The next moment, she saw Gufei turn around and jump down. Hey, you, Yen Ziazu cried out in surprise. It was possible for players to fall to their deaths in game and their ability to survive this differed for every job class. Currently, Mage was definitely not a job class that could survive falling from a height above 10 meters. Yen Ziazu poked her head out hoping to catch this tragedy, yet all she witnessed was Gufei reaching out his hand right before he came crashing down to the ground, blinking mid-descent, and appearing on the ground safe and sound in the next moment. Gufei glanced up at her and asked, What? Yen Ziazu was speechless. Rumors had it that mages would have to depend on the usage of their spells, like the ones that could slow their descent or make them weightless, to survive a fall from such heights, and using a spell like blink while falling would indeed be grand enough a gesture. She did not dare leap off from such height herself, so she clutched onto the rope and carefully slid down uneventfully. Gufei retrieved the hook and stowed it away, as Yen Ziazu asked, Now what? I'll return the next time and continue my observation, he answered. Just like today? She asked. Just like today, he confirmed. Perhaps, there might be other methods, she said, that would still require the gathering of information. Do you need me to inquire after anything else? No need for that, temporarily. I'll inform you accordingly if I think of anything, 
he said. You want me to seek my big sis for help? She knows more stuff that I do, she suggested. Gu Fei thought back on how Slyrus had deduced his identity, evidently showing how clear-minded the lady was. And compared to this immigrant Yen Ziazu, she should have a more comprehensive knowledge of Ziaotu City and might be able to lend a hand. Well, in that case, I'll look for you two sisters if anything else crops up. Gu Fei said. The two bid each other farewell as Gu Fei began to think of Giordano's movements from before, hoping to find something he could exploit from it. That was when Brother Assist suddenly sent him over a message. I got something. What? Gu Fei replied. There are plenty of cities nearby with an oak forest, but considering that the Shadow Mist assassin passed by Lin Shui City before reaching Zia the city from that diary entry, this could only mean that there is only one city. Brother Assist said, Linian City, I presume? Gu Fei guessed. How did you know? Brother Assist was shocked. Because there are plenty of trees there, he replied. Such a conjecture is just too crude, if you must know. Gu Fei immediately interrupted Brother Assist from further typing out that message as he sent another message immediately. I've gotten something as well. What? Gu Fei relayed to the man the whole story once more. As Brother Assist asked at the first moment he got, this quest doesn't show up in your quest log? Yup. TSK. Brother Assist was another person that had a gamer's mindset. Chapter 459, The Same Matter The Six Men of Young Master's Elite convened in the tavern once more. These MMO veterans simply could not approve of Gu Fei coming up with his very own quest when there was nothing listed on his quest log. War Without Wounds and Royal God Call had strolled a big round in the city, but due to the heavy fog permeating the surroundings, they were unable to catch sight of any babes or even find any quest NPCs. They were not used to grinding monsters in such a setting as well, so they sincerely disliked the city and were already voicing out their wish to leave. At this time, Brother Assist was also all the more anxious to leave for Linian City to find that log cabin in the Oak Forest, and War Without Wounds and Royal God Call felt that Brother Assist's analysis was far more reliable. The two men were actively trying to convince Gu Fei to be considerate and stop getting caught up in that fantastical storyline he had crafted for himself. Hearing their attempts at persuasion, Gu Fei also showed a similar look of disapproval. To me, Gu Fei began, levels, experience, and equipment are not the most important. I consider this game to be another life that I lead and it is the best place for me to demonstrate what I've learned, so it doesn't really matter to me where I acquire my quests because the end result that I pursue isn't the same as the quest reward that you guys desire. He glanced at the men before him for a moment before continuing, it's apparent that this game is different from the other MMOs made in the past. The new technical aspects that come with this fully immersive environment means it can create new circumstances that haven't existed before. You'll have limited enjoyment in parallel world if you guys continue to hold on to the same ideals you have from other games. Fuck. The experts all lifted their middle fingers toward Gu Fei in unison. There was never a turn for this outsider to lecture them when it came to gaming. The name of this MMO is Parallel World, therein lies some truth to it. Ultimately, this world rests in the hands of all the players. It'll only remain as just a game if everybody continues to see and play it according to how people play Kimchi Games 1. Change your mentality and this can very well be a true Parallel World, Gu Fei insisted. Look at what progress he has made. He can even say such a term like kimchi games. Royal God Call turned to look at the others. Sword Demon was looking at Gu Fei thoughtfully after hearing his speech, and everybody could clearly tell from his eyes that he was really considering this earnestly. Sure enough, Sword Demon suddenly nodded. What you said makes sense. I'd like to try this assassinate Giordano quest with you. Of course, you can. Gu Fei smiled. Fill me in on the current details. Sword Demon said, Look at this. Gu Fei took out that diary and began to explain to him what he had observed on the wall as the two men buried their heads and discussed. Oh no, Sword Demon is learning bad things from Miles. War Without Wounds gazed at the other three mercenaries and muttered. Royal God Call gave Gu Fei a sidelong glance as he pointed at that booklet of his and said, Miles learned bad things from Brother Assist. Fuck off. Brother Assist cursed. Even though Gu Fei's present use of a booklet to explain the situation was indeed similar to how he operated. What about us? Are we still gonna head to Linian City to take a look? 
War without wounds asked. Well, Brother Assist suddenly began to speak in a low whisper, keeping his mouth away from Goofy. Without Miles Andrew Sue's diary, I'm afraid there's no way we can get the quest in the first place. Oh, you're right. These men were still staunchly holding on to their conventional MMO mentality. I can't loan you this diary yet, Goofy said. Fuck me, this guy has really sharp ears. The three men jumped in shock. Goofy grimaced and shook his head before continuing. There might be further clues in the contents of this diary, I still want to research into things a bit more. Why don't we head off to Linian City first? If it's truly a necessary quest item, we'll get Miles to mail it over. I reckon Miles will be more or less done with his research by then, War Without Wounds suggested. Are you implying that you are not confident with the conclusion I came to from the information I gathered? Brother Assist was discontented. He strongly believed that the quest would be found over by Linian City. No, 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 War Without Wounds hurriedly corrected himself. I just mean that we can make our move first, and the diary can be sent over to us at a later time. Much better. Brother Assist nodded. Then, what about you? The five men all looked toward the sixth man, young Master Han. The rest had all decided what they would be doing but he had yet to show any inclination toward either option. You're a bunch of idiots, young Master Han said. Forget this motherfucker, he's really detestable. Everybody said one after another. Am I wrong? Young Master Han retorted, you guys heading off with brother assist is to follow the clues left behind in that diary and to pick up the quest that the Shadow Mist Assassin failed to accomplish. Just what quest is this? Isn't it the same thing as what Miles is currently doing? The five were all left in a daze. Basically, even if you guys run all the way to Linian City and manage to pick up the quest, you will still end up coming here to do the same thing as what Miles is doing, so what difference does it make? Yet here you guys are disagreeing over minor details. What else can you all be but a bunch of idiots? Young Master Han said. Um, perhaps, the situation will change after picking up the quest. Brother Assist tried to reason. This was also a very logical assumption based off on conventional MMOs, completing the previous step might very well provide a solution to something that could not currently be done. No way, it can change? Gufe was afraid of this. He had worked hard at jotting down everything he had observed in his booklet. Everything would go to waste once more if the situation changed when the quest was picked up on their end. It's just a speculation, Brother Assist hurriedly added. I think it's best if we follow what we've just agreed on. Brother Assist and you guys shall head over to Linian City to see if the quest really exists. Miles and I will remain here and take note of the situation. If it's really a quest. We will wait for the others to return from picking up the quest, and we can all finish it together. Sword Demon proposed. Oh, that works, too. Goofy nodded his head in agreement. Doing it this way ensured everybody could do what they had all decided on. Brother Assist, War Without Wounds, and Royal God Call all got up and immediately departed for Lin Shui City. I'll bring you to check out the situation over there. Goofy said to Sword Demon. As the two of them got up and prepared to leave, Goofy tossed that diary over to young Master Han before he left, you should take a look, too. It was an undeniable fact that he was a smart man. It would simply be too much of a waste if his intellect were treated as a receptacle to contain liquor and were not properly utilized. Young Master Han dragged the diary right before him and used it as a coaster. If I'm bored. Goofy and Sword Demon left the tavern and returned to the government city hall, but he chose another spot of the wall to climb this time. The previous spot Goofy had chosen was right in front of the government city hall. While that was a good position to observe what was happening right outside the entrance, the view of the back of the government city hall would be obstructed by the very building itself, so Goofy was currently unaware of anything there. Giordano's patrolling did not include the area behind the building. But Goofy wanted to find out if any sort of opportunities existed there. There just might be a way to sneak into the building itself to assassinate the target if there was no way that they could do the deed in the courtyard. Since there was no need to consider entering through the main entrance, there might just be such a chance available from the back. That was the conclusion that Goofy and Sword Demon arrived to from their discussion. After choosing a spot, Goofy tossed the hook up the wall and showed Sword Demon another eye opener. Look. There's no fog in the courtyard. Goofy had already told this phenomenon to Sword Demon, 
and he was affirming this fact by showing it to the thief, yeah. Sword Demon nodded. The government city hall's architecture was definitely unlike that of modern skyscrapers but was, instead, similar to a castle in an ancient mountain village, which towered above the walls surrounding the courtyard, looking foreboding and ominous. The area behind the government city hall was not as spacious as the courtyard in front of the building, but the design was far more refined. The manicured lawn had a cobblestone path, flower beds and small crops of trees that tastefully dotted the area. There was even a small stream that ran through it, as both Gufei and Sword Demon could vividly hear the sound of flowing water. Evidently, the back of the government city hall was a place for peace and relaxation, similar to a household's backyard. It was apparently far too unpleasant to station guards bearing fierce mugs and weapons in such a picturesque place. So Gufei was pleasantly surprised to find the lack of any form of protection and defense here. Never would he have thought that it would be so effortless. With this, he proceeded to search for the back door to the government city hall. Over here. Sword Demon found it first and stretched his hand out to indicate it to him. The door was nowhere as grandiose as the one by the entrance, but there were nevertheless two guards flanking its sides respectively. Gufei fished out the spyglass for a closer look and saw that they looked no different from the common guards. There was bound to be trouble wherever a guard was situated, so Gufei continued to observe with the spyglass when he suddenly asked Sword Demon a question. What's the era setting for this game? What? Sword Demon was stunned by this question that came out of nowhere. It's nothing. I was just suddenly curious of the world we are in and wanted to know more about it, Gufei explained. This, I'm not too sure myself, Sword Demon said. Looking at the architecture of this place, I'm not sure what sort of style this is. Gufei sighed. I don't know either. Sword Demon suddenly felt somewhat guilty, for he had just realized that despite being a peak expert when it came to MMOs, his understanding toward any one game was very lopsided. In fact, there were many superficial aspects of the game that he was uncertain about. Equipment, skill, PvP techniques. Were that all there was to a game's nuance? This government city hall is designed in the style of Baroque architecture, someone suddenly quipped. Gufei and Sword Demon jumped in shock. Turning their heads back in a hurry, they found Yenzi Azu making funny faces at them. While Slyras was right beside her, Slyras resumed speaking about the matter as she looked at the building before them. If I'm not mistaken, the interspersing curved facades and oval spaces are a common feature in Baroque architecture. Slyras turned toward the two men after sharing this information and continued, There's no way to definitively nail down the era this game is adopted from based on architecture alone, but just from the goods, such as glass optics, that appear in parallel world. We can narrow down the era to be sometime in the 18th century, as those products were first made in that period. Glass Optics The two men had no idea why Slyras had suddenly raised this. Your spyglass. Slyras pointed to the item Gufei was holding. You must be a scientist. Gufei and Sword Demon did not wish to admit their lack of knowledge regarding such stuff. He he, I told you my big sis knows a lot of things. Yenzi Azu bragged. I don't think this is the time to discuss this. Gufei recovered. What are the both of you doing here? There was no one else when Gufei and Sword Demon clambered up the wall, so these two ladies probably came right after and just made their way over to them. My big sis and I came over to take a look after discussing about your matter. Yenzi Azu informed. Chapter 460, Access Permit Have you guys found a method yet? Slyris asked Gufei and Sword Demon. We don't have to aggro the guards, Gufei said. I wonder if it is possible to sneak in through a window. Speaking of which, how did you two get up here? He <laughs> he. Yenzi Azu looked all mysterious, not wishing to say a word. Sword Demon, who had long noticed a cloud-like glimmer that hallowed around Slyra's feet, asked, Is that the mage's flight skill? Yup. Slyris nodded what's that? Gufei asked Sword Demon. It's a mage spell. It allows the user to fly for a short duration, Sword Demon replied. How magical, Gufei mused. But it only lasts for a short while and has a long cooldown. It's useful when fleeing but has limited use in combat, Sword Demon gave an honest assessment. Indeed. Slyris nodded in agreement. Still, I don't think that spell lets you carry another when you fly, am I right? Sword Demon took a quick glance at Yen Ha ha. 
Yenzi and Zhu laughed. The two hands she had been hiding behind her back all this while were now revealed to be carrying a coil of rope identical to the grappling hook of Gu Fei. She proudly declared, I have one, two. You're a quick learner. Gu Fei commended. I had a good teacher. At least, she did not forget to be modest. Having spent some time engaging in polite small talk, it was time to get down to actual business. What do you guys plan to do? Slyer is asked. No need to alert the guards. I think it's be best if I can sneak in through a window, Gu Fei said. Do you know the layout within? Which room the target is in, or if there are guards stationed within? Slyer is asked. I don't know, do you? Gu Fei returned the question. As far as I know, there's only one player who has been able to enter the government city hall, and that person will surely have an idea of what to expect inside, Slyer said. Who? Gu Fei and Sword Demon asked at the same time. Cool Apple, Slyrus answered. Didn't Brother Assist mention about that person being ranked something on the Thief leaderboard? Gu Fei asked Sword Demon for confirmation. Fourth. Sword Demon confirmed. He more or less knew the names of those that were listed on the Thief leaderboard. Even if Brother Assist did not mention Cool Apple, he was already aware of that person's existence. That's the one. Slyrus nodded. This man's a park maniac who often looks for players to kill whenever he's got nothing to do. I heard that, as a result of accumulating a huge amount of park value, he ended up doing plenty of bounty mission and earned himself something called a bounty license, which lets him enter the government building. Gufe was immediately beside himself with joy when he heard this. I've got a bounty license, too. At the same time. He marveled at how big the world was. Others were sure to have accomplished the same things he had done. Even though Gu Fei was skilled, and Bounty Mission was the one specific thing he did, the amount of time he spent online was limited, nevertheless. Others probably expended more time than he did, but they were still able to achieve the same feat. After all, Sword Demon had also managed to grind for a pair of Wind Chasers boots all by himself. Gu Fei took out his Bounty License and asked, my bounty license is number one. What number is his? Naturally, nobody was able to answer this. Gu Fei did not really care to contemplate over this particular detail as he questioned Slyrus about something else. How do I go about doing this? Do I just flash this to the guards before I enter? I, I'm not too sure myself. Let me give it a try. Gu Fei proposed. Now, it might be a little troublesome at the moment because Flower Gazing in the Fog is still in the middle of doing their guild quest. I'm afraid that their guild won't easily let players enter the government city hall. Slyra's dissuaded. I'll tell them I've got a quest. Gu Fei said. Plenty of troublemakers have used that excuse. Flower Gazing in the Fog will surely treat you the same as those guys. Slyra's said. Honestly speaking. I'm just the same as those troublemakers since I intend to assassinate the NPC in charge of their quest. I wonder what sort of penalty they'll receive to their quest progress as a result. Gu Fei stared into the distance melancholically. The rest were speechless. I wonder if I can still use my bounty license if I try to enter through the back door, Gu Fei wondered aloud. Of course, no one was able to answer this question as well. Let me give it a shot. Gu Fei resolved as he hopped off the wall, blinked in midair, and landed softly on the ground. There were no members of Flower Gazing in the Fog in the backyard, since they had never thought that it was possible for anyone to climb up a wall over 10 meters high. Thus, they focused all their attention and manpower on the main entrance to the building, only minding the players that passed through there. Sword Demon and the other two ladies stood by the wall and watched Gu Fei sprint over to the back door the moment he landed on the ground. Yen Ziezu instantly secured that hook of hers by the wall and said, I'll get this ready in case he needs to make a run for it. In the end, Gu Fei paused for a moment as he approached the two guards and then turned to wave at the three before entering the government city hall. Success! The three could not help but feel excited over this despite accomplishing such a simple step. This was actually the first time Gu Fei had entered such a huge building in the game. The hall within was spacious, candelabras hung on the two walls by the side, while the number of guards matched the number of candelabras. Each of them was spaced out every few meter, flanking the path that stretched. None of them reacted when Gu Fei entered their sights. This was evidently the effect of having a bounty license. Gu Fei was emboldened as well. Walking up to the guard, he asked, Where's Giordano? Third floor, 
Vigilante Core Chamber, the guard answered. Can you show me the way? Gufei tried to push his luck. It was just a NPC, so he might as well use them as much as he could. No, the guard actually gave him a reply. Gufei had no choice but to find his way. He soon received a message from Sword Demon. What's the situation? The layout's complex, Gufei replied. He actually could not find the stairs up making him feel as if a royal god call had infected him. He ended up asking another guard for direction, but he was still unable to find the stairs despite heading in the indicated direction, there was nothing else beyond the walls and doors. But when he pushed a random door open, Gufei did not know whether he should laugh or cry, as it turned out that all the doors on this wall were connected to a large hallway, where a spiral staircase led right up on either side respectively. Gufei took the stairs up to the third floor and found another guard to ask where Giordano was located before he finally ended up right outside the door to the vigilante core chamber. Gufei took a deep breath. Is it really going to be this easy? Will this in the moment I enter and slay Giordano? It's a game, after all, so even if I die here, the quest will still be completed. Gufei thought to himself as he stepped through the doorway. He was sorely mistaken. This was a really huge chamber and there were plenty of people within. Giordano was dressed differently from all the other guards, and it stood right in the middle of a host of guards. It stood right in front of Gufei, yet Gufei did not dare to make a move. If it was already difficult taking on a single guard, what more of a whole host of them? He did not even stand a chance to get anywhere near Giordano. In the end, Gufei decided to observe the situation for the moment first to see if these NPCs would simply stand where they were or would move about. Gufei was very patient, so when he saw that there were seats and couches in the chamber, he simply decided to head over to one and take a seat. A game's just a game, after all. Gufei leaned back on the couch luxuriantly and thought, has there ever been such an arrogant assassin that sits so brazenly before their target like this? It's truly too comical. Gufei was patient. This was not the case for those three, however. After waiting in the wind up the wall for such a long time, they finally could not bear the wait any longer. How are things? Have you found the floor yet? Sword Demon sent another message to ask. I found it, and I even located the target, but I have yet to find a chance to strike. There are just too many guards present, Gufei answered. Does it not move about? Is there not a moment when it's alone? Sword Demon asked. That's what I'm waiting for, Gufei replied. Where are you waiting? Sword Demon asked. Right beside him. Gufei replied. Sword Demon's mind swirled with thoughts once more. Gufei's previous speech of acting a role in the game to live another life had impacted him greatly, but he realized how difficult it was to pick up such a mantle when he saw the situation that they were currently in. It was really far too inauthentic and unreal for there to be no reaction from an assassin's target when said parties were face to face with one another. Even if this was just a game, it should not be exaggerated to such levels. Sword Demon believed that this reason was entirely because Gufei had not picked up this quest at all, so Giordano did not treat him as an assassin but merely a player who had the rights to enter the government city hall. A game has to follow its regulations at the end of the day. Sword Demon was a little disappointed, for he had really been looking forward to experience this sort of a real second world like what Gufei had mentioned. Meanwhile, Gufei had been sitting in the chamber for quite some time, feeling a little sorry when he thought about the three other players still waiting for him outside. He decided to send a message to them. Who knows how long I got to wait here. Do the three of you wish to make a move first? There's no rush, the three replied. Gufei pondered further when an idea suddenly came to him. He got up abruptly and went around the chamber once, reaching out to open a side door. There was nobody in this side room, and junk was piled up high in it. It seemed that it had been used as a storage room of sort. Gufei stood by the door and immediately yelled out, Giordano. Giordano turned his head as Gufei backed out of that room while reciting in his head, Come over. Come over. Come on over. Gufei daringly used the game's regulation in hopes of luring the unthinking NPC into this empty room, closing the door and killing it after. In the end, Giordano gazed at him and did not move. Instead, it yelled as well, Oh, you're here. It's this guy this time. Arrest this man and bring him to justice. What? Gufei could not make sense of what was happening. Giordano stood there unmoving, 
but he extended his hand out after shouting at Gufay. Gufay walked over in a daze, and Giordano passed over a stack of papers while saying, This is his information. Gufay reached out to take it, and a system prompt immediately rang, Daily Bounty Mission Accepted. Daily bounty mission was different from the normal bounty mission. It was possible to be refreshed at anew, but everybody could only pick it up once a day, and there was a limit to the amount of missions offered, going by a first-come first-served basis. Aside from daily missions, there were also weekly and monthly missions or quests. The higher the level of these missions or quests was, the more bountiful the eventual reward would be. Daily missions like these would mainly provide gold coins and experience but it would be an amount far more than that from a normal mission or quest. In some of the locations where the players had a firm grasp when these daily missions would be made available, players would flood and swarm them at the reset time, amid countless altercations that precipitated. In the end, powerful guilds were usually the ones who would gain a monopoly to these missions or quests, which eventually became an important in-game resource that the many guilds often fought over for control. Gufay had neither done a daily bounty mission nor ever considered it, but he had inexplicably accepted one today.